Well, I, I think it's about time I took you on a writer's journey with screenwriting expert and author Christopher Vogler. <laughs> Welcome to the Film Threat Podcast. I hope you are having a good day today. It's always a good day when I get to talk to authors, uh, which which I, I love to do. Um, Chris Vogler, Christopher Vogler, thank you for being on the Film Threat Podcast uh, with us today. That's a treat. Glad to be here. His book, The Writer's Journey, has influenced so many people. I mean, your book is, it's, uh, it's as as I said before we started this, I have not read the book which I feel terribly guilty for, but I feel like the, the concepts of your book have just permeated Hollywood and good screenwriting. And it's the book that comes recommended to me. I promise I will read it after this. I'm getting, I, apparently the new edition of the book has an additional chapter, but, but you are someone who comes up, there's th the three screenwriting books that are the pillar, right? There's the Sid Field book, which everybody knows. It's yeah. mostly about format, right? Um, and then, of course, uh, there's the Save the Cat book, which, which has it really sort of hits hard on a couple of uh, a couple of things. But yours really is about the that hero's myth, that journey, and each of the chapters is broken up into um, that that hero's journey that we know about from Joseph Campbell. Tell me what led to the writing of the first edition of the book. Well, you know, as a kid, I was looking for patterns all the time. Even when my mother and grandmother read me fairy tales, I was already analyzing them like a, a, a professional, you know, uh, development executive trying to figure out what's missing and what would make a good Disney animated feature, what would you have to add to it. But I was looking for, I was on a quest looking for those hidden rules, and I knew there had to be some kind of algorithm or something uh, about how they constructed these beautiful things that I enjoyed so much. And uh, when I got to film school, after uh, going through the journalism school and uh, the Air Force and making documentaries for them, at film school, I found there weren't really any screenwriting books. This is before Sid Field wrote his book. So we only had a playwriting book to work with. And um, then I found the work of Joseph Campbell, uh, and, and it just opened my eyes, and it was the thing I was looking for. Here's the algorithm. Here's the inner pattern of the, the deeper structure of what the story is trying to do to connect with an audience. And that just set me off, and it happened to uh, come into my consciousness at the same time that the first Star Wars movie came out. And I went and saw it and said, George Lucas has read Joseph Campbell, and, and he is following uh, all these ancient mythological patterns, but he's revived them. And, uh, oh boy, my career, everybody's career is going to be different after this. Well, yeah, it's um, uh, Joseph Campbell did the book. If if I'm correct, it's Hero with a Thousand Faces. Perfect. Is that right? Yeah. But it's more of an um, anthropological look at cultures and how storytelling in different cultures has so many similarities. Um, did you did you draw from some of that for your book? And how is your book different? I, I'm guessing it is because it applies to screenwriting specifically, that makes it distinct um, unto itself. But what, what else is different that you identified in your book? Well, I took Campbell's ideas, which are complex and poetic. And also he was really aiming at something psychological. He was trying to uh, give people in the 50s, he wrote about 1949, I think is when the, the book came out, but he was thinking about what they call the organization man, the guy who uh, just went to work and was in a grind all, all the time and felt like his life didn't mean anything. And uh, so he was trying to give people back a sense of meaning. And I took that uh, away from it. But I was thinking about screenwriting and uh, I took Campbell's pattern and compared it to a lot of scripts, a lot of uh, movies that I liked. And I found uh, that there was a little bit simpler way to present it with 12 stages instead of sometimes he has 16, sometimes he has 36, but uh, you know, a much more complex uh, matter. And, and I sort of simplified it uh, with the idea of making it useful, making it a template in a way that uh, writers could use to compare their work 
and uh, also in development to help people uh, decide what scripts were working. If it wasn't working, what's wrong and how can we fix it? it well, it's interesting because um, what I know about your book is that it's so well regarded in the sense that it it breaks everything down into those into into identifying these patterns so that, say, you know, a seasoned screenwriter and a development executive can at least have a conversation on the same level. They, they know what they're talking about. I'm curious, you brought up Star Wars earlier. And of course, uh, Star Wars is, uh, I think, a gateway drug for many people in terms of just falling in love with movies because it so follows those patterns. I'm curious what you think of sort of the use of these myths today. I think we've seen a shift in storytelling um, and, and the, the sequel trilogy, which I'm I, I sort of have mixed feelings about, you know, I, I like at least half of one of the films, um, but it, it sort of went off the rails. Can you, uh, if you care to speculate, like what was the thinking and going with the Disney sequel trilogy and how it may have drifted um, from, from the concepts that, that you espouse? Well, I think, you know, the, the thing that everybody harks back to and, and what they're trying in a way to recapture in all these follow-up films is that sense of wonder and just like, wow, this is so cool and amazing and I'm not going to judge this or edit it. I, I'm just going to enjoy like a little kid. And that's really a hard energy to retain. And I think even Lucas himself had some trouble as he got older and took on all the weight and responsibility of running a huge company and so forth and being a father and, and a family man. Um, he drifted away from his uh, childhood, from that raw childhood wonder, big eyed, you know, amazement at things. And um, it's, it's difficult. So, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 I think the way Hollywood looks at sequels and so forth is we had this mine and uh, we have to go in and get more gold out of that mine. And it's easy to lose track of, of the initial inspiration. It's there in flashes. You know, you'll see a scene here and there, but that overall thing is elusive. And so, you know, I, I, uh, I don't envy them the job of trying to carry on something that was just kind of innocent and magical. Well, I, I thought you were just going to say it sucked. Uh, I don't think that it... <laughs> I don't. I don't think that that's true. I think that it maybe uh, it, it sort of you know defied people's expectations. They were expecting to see, which I think is the biggest crime of this uh, sequel trilogy, the reunion of Han, Luke, and Leia, which didn't happen. Which I think is, if I were an executive sitting in the room, I think that's sort of like number one on the list. Is you get the three heroes from the original trilogy, you have them reunite in some way throw in Lando for good measure and some other people. There's got to be some reunion than the passing of the baton. And we didn't see that. I, I, I think, I think, you know, we'll, we'll see how it holds up. You know, I actually think oddly the, the star Wars prequel trilogy actually um, uh, holds up. It's, it's actually, when you look back on it, I think it's better than when we first saw it. Maybe it was so different than what we had expected that uh, it was a little jarring. And now looking back, it's like, oh, wow, there was a real planning to it. I saw a documentary called The Prequel Strike Back that really expounded upon that. But your your book is the one, I mean, it has to be, if not the top screenwriting book, also, you know, at least in the, in the top three, if not the top. It's just the one that's always been there. What's different in this now? I mean, it's 25 years. First of all, I can't, I, it's, I can't imagine, you must be really proud to have uh, a property that's been around 25 years and now in a new edition. What's new in this edition? And what have you observed over this 25 years and the influence that the book has had? Yeah, it's pretty remarkable, you know, to for any book to be in print for 25 years is a, kind of a big deal. It would be like having a play that it stays in the theater for 25 years or a movie that runs, you know, continuously uh, screened for, for 25 years. So it's uh, it's a big achievement and I'm, I'm pleased about that. Um, it, the thing that I tried to do a little differently was I really stuck my neck out this time to talk about things that have been coming up in the last few years as I went around teaching, uh, which has to do with the body and how the uh, experience of watching a film or reading a script or telling a story to somebody 
is really experienced in the body. And I went to um, a system developed basically in India called the chakra system. And I wrote a chapter about that because I noticed uh, when I was working for the studios that when I commented on a script or when I was trying to pitch a, a script I'd read over the weekend and I wanted other people to read it and get enthused about it like me, I would usually comment by pointing at different parts of my body. I'd say it got me here, it choked me up, and I felt something in my guts, uh, it, uh, the tension of it twisted up my guts. Or I'd say, I got this wonderful lift right at the end, up, up here somewhere. And I'd point to these different centers up and down the body. And by theory, the chakras are at least seven major uh, centers up and down the body. And I think there's something to it, to thinking about those as targets for your emotional effects. I want to, I want this scene, I want this line of dialogue to hit you right here or right here. And another thing I learned was that um, it's nice if you get two of those body centers working at the same time. In other words, I'm terrified and I'm way down in my lowest chakra, defensively crouched down there. But at the same time, my heart is opening up. And when you get two elements like that going, then you really have something. And if you don't, you've got a kind of one dimensional experience. Well, that, that really makes a lot of sense because I think the films that stay with us are the ones that definitely have some element of spirituality, right? I mean, uh, I, I think that, I mean, that's why Star Wars, I think, remains one of the most popular film franchises of all time is simply because it it is tapped into that so innately. Yeah, it was very interesting that uh, from the beginning, Lucas did have this vision, you know, it, it was like uh, what I think probably happened to Wagner when he saw the whole picture of his vast uh, Twilight of the Gods sagas um, and his operas, uh, that, that, that he had this very clear vision and that part of it was this idea of the force, which was this vague thing, but people really latched onto it and uh, didn't so much make it a religion. I guess some did, but for most people, it was just, oh, there's a hopeful thing and a way of talking about things. I mean, uh, movies sometimes give us language to describe things we don't have real language for, but we can we can talk about things. And this is what Campbell said about the myths, that the myths are metaphors for something that's beyond human comprehension, that you can't really figure out with your brain but uh, or with the tools of science, but you can get at it sort of indirectly, poetically through stories and, and uh, myths and fairy tales. So uh, I, I like that uh, that approach to things to kind of sneak around the defenses of the brain and uh, affect these centers directly. Well, it's interesting. I am fortunate enough to have the opportunity to interview a lot of filmmakers and screenwriters, and I always like to ask them for tips. One of the um, one of the tips that just recurs over and over again is uh, really, if you want to make it in film, it's just hard work. That's it. It's just bottom line is hard work and consistency is the is the tip that I that I hear over and over again. But you have so much experience in this field. You've read so many screenplays, acted as a consultant. It's what what it, what it, what if you had a tip or a thing that you recognize a pattern in, say, bad screenplays or something like this is the bad. This is what bad screenplays do. This is what this is what a good screenplay does. Can you identify those things and maybe just offer some insight? Yeah, I think uh, you know one of the things I encounter all the time is that um, in my own writing, I tend to state the obvious, and uh, I will come out and, in the first draft at least, write kind of all the cliches and and put down all the uh, kind of obvious things that people might say, uh, and then I try to go back and mess that up a little bit and make it um, uh, more indirect or or think I gave that character the action because it makes sense and he's the obvious one. Well, let's give it the line of dialogue to somebody else and see what happens. And a lot of times I see that happen uh, on the set where, uh, you know, uh, a, a director who is on his or her toes uh, will be free about that and, and will say, you know what, that line of dialogue really would work better in somebody else's mouth. And uh, another thing that that proved very important in the editing room in what little time I spent there uh, was subtracting things, taking stuff out 
So you write first kind of a, a, a vomit draft, some people call it, where you just get everything out on the page and then you start pulling stuff out. And there's this magic thing that happens where the attention that was devoted to this line of dialogue and this character and this scene, uh, when you take those lines and characters and so forth out, the energy remains and it flows into the lines of dialogue and the characters and the scenes that remain. So, you know, you, you, you feel like you're losing something when you make a cut, but in fact, it's a, it's a gain for whatever remains on the page or on the screen. And, and that, that uh, helped me to get over, uh, oh, you know, cherishing every line I wrote. It's funny, uh, what you said earlier makes so much sense is I, I think just, and you notice it in films that are lazy, they kind of just do what's expected. I yeah. guess what I would call your approach to be like salted caramel, because whoever thought to put salt on caramel, why would you do that? And then of course, anyone who's ever tasted salted caramel, it's amazing, right? Like everybody loves salted caramel. I feel like what you said right at the top about just defying expectations, going for not the obvious or changing, a, you know, giving some other character a line. Um, I, I think that that's what you really have to think from the beginning. I think that that's a great, that's a great tip. I'm going to call that salted caramel. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. I'm sorry. I've got a, a Oh, you got a call. Hey, it happens. It happens during, uh, during interviews sometimes. I feel um, it. Whatever it is. This is the weird w world we're living in right now with like Zoom calls and, uh, you know, the way, you know, there are no in-person, uh, you know, lunch meetings. Although I, I got to say, I don't miss going to the lunch meetings anymore. I mean, L.A. is such a weird city to traverse that uh, I, I, I actually I actually kind of like the Zoom calls. I'm actually getting more done uh, yeah. in the in the lockdown. So. Yeah, things had changed uh, just before all this uh, took place. It was uh, clear to everybody it was getting harder to navigate and do, you know, efficiently the kind of meeting schedule you used to do. Sometimes people would come to town and they could do three or four meetings a day by driving around, but then the traffic got so bad. Uh, of course, now we're in a completely different <laughs> situation. Well, it's interesting. I, I remember having a conversation with Richard Linklater once, um, and he's based in Austin, Texas. And he told me that he actually liked being based in Austin because when he came to town, people would cancel meetings to meet with him rather than if he just lived here. It's just like, well, we could meet any time. It doesn't matter. So he said that actually by not being in Hollywood, it made um, him more desirable as a filmmaker because when he came to town, it actually was kind of a big deal. Richard Linklater's in town you know, let, let, let's, let's, let's cancel a meeting to meet with him. So, but now we live in zoom times. So our Google meet, whatever, that's what I like to use Google. And this is, this is the way we are now. I think we're going to see a lot of screenplays. I've had a lot of friends claim they're going to write their screenplay. Um, they're going to, they're going to do it. They're definitely going to do it. And they're going to write that screenplay during this lockdown. What are we going to, I'm, curious what your thoughts are about what we're going to see, because I don't know when the end is in sight for this yeah. is, and so, so much of films being successful are about what's in the zeitgeist and some filmmakers and screenwriters are really, a, really, they're really attuned to that. I, I, this is why I'm so, I'm so excited about uh, reading your book because it really does have a spirit. It takes, it takes in into account spirituality. And I feel like there's something, there's another um, book I'm sure you're aware of. It's Catching the Big Fish mm -hmm. by David Lynch, which is just sure. about creativity and ideas and how it's also about transcendental meditation and how you, by tapping into that, you can, you, you it, it just helps you to be creative. Um, I'm just curious about your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, you know, uh, this is something that I thought about a lot when the coronavirus situation arrived. Um, I had to take my hero's journey pattern, which was sort of a nice Swiss army knife for, uh, you know, dealing with story problems and outlining scripts and uh, troubleshooting and so forth. But I had to turn it around and apply it to the uh, current crisis situation. And I found that it it matches up fairly well and it even kind of predicts where we're going because the hero's journey as i see it is sort of a universal description of what anybody goes through trying to do something difficult or change things in themselves or in the world 
And uh, so that system kind of predicts that, um, first of all, people will go inward. And, and, and I urge them to do that. Uh, the, and I feel that there is kind of a shamanic responsibility that uh, creative people have, like the shamans in the old days, when there was a problem in the neighborhood, people would go to the shaman, the wise witch doctor, or whatever, excuse me. No worries. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> I'll just deal with that. <laughs> Hopefully it's someone calling, needing your services, or uh, <laughs> it happens. Um, but uh, is it is everything okay, Chris? Hello? Well, this is, this is, uh, you know, it happens to the best of us. Uh, sometimes we get important calls in the middle of an interview. Got to take those calls. Um, I'm uh, I, I'm gonna recommend in addition to, to Christopher's book, um, the David Lynch book, Catching the Big Fish. Oh, we we lost we lost Christopher. Well, um, what can I say? Never had an interview uh, end this way. Um, hopefully, Chris will be back. Uh, but um, I want to thank our sponsor, Storyblocks. Storyblocks. Um, if you are an aspiring filmmaker, if you're a filmmaker, uh, we've actually talked to filmmakers on the podcast who've used Storyblocks. Storyblocks is a, a stock footage. They have stock footage. They have uh, music that you can use. They've got, I mean, if you want to really up your game and take your indie film from a low budget to a big budget looking project, Storyblocks is incredible and I cannot recommend it enough. We use it here at Film Threat. Hey, and Christopher is back. I, I am. Just, okay. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're back. We've never had this happen. We've never had this happen. But, you know, it's like every it's like every Zoom call. There's that first five or ten minutes at the top where people got to like, I'm hearing echo. I don't yeah. see you. But, um, you know, I forgot what we were talking about before. But uh, but it's really like. I think we we're talking about like how how you know this quarantine, this lockdown is going to affect things that are in the zeitgeist and how that might impact storytelling. Yeah, well, I think a couple of things are going to happen. What I was saying uh, before I interrupted myself, I yeah, <laughs> that's okay. I told, I told it's a first. Kid. It's a first. But uh, you know it, that I encourage people to go inside and to uh, consult, like the shamans did, with their sources of inspiration and come back because people need to be entertained. Uh, they need two things at once. Uh, and I think this is what we're going to see in entertainment uh, in the immediate frame. Uh, one is we need to process what's going on. So we need to see people in masks and we need to see people, you know, arguing about whether you should wear a mask or not and have that be part of the content for a while. Um, and then later, maybe we'll go back and even reflect on it more. But uh, we need that immediate processing, but we also need uh, to be taken away from all this because everybody's sick of it. And uh, we need to be uh, amused and stimulated in other ways. And I think it's just great that the human race evolved the ability to do this, what we're doing right now, before we really needed it. Uh, and then that we evolved all of this uh, way of... Uh, of uh, storing and playing at will, uh, all kinds of entertainment. It's, it's really been a lifesaver for a lot of people, uh, really for their sanity in this time. When you're isolated, it can drive you crazy. And so we need uh, you know, that sense of, of observing other humans and comparing our behavior to those of the people in the, in the stories. And uh, it, it's actually healthy. Yeah, I, I I agree. I mean, I don't think I would be surviving this as well if I wasn't binge watching new shows yeah. or independent films on VOD. That's that's been a lifesaver. And then just for work wise, I mean, I'm someone who works at home. A lot of writers work at home, um, so uh, I, I, my schedule's kind of the same. I'm just doing a lot more Google Meets, but but I'm really curious to see how it impacts. I think I think you're going to see 
TV series and films set in the year 2020 that will address something that's happening that we can now, you know, having been through it, really process it. Or you can just watch Contagion for a preview of what's going to happen. Steven right. Soderbergh's Contagion, which I think is a great film. Um, I, I want to thank our sponsor, um, Storyblocks. If you go to storyblocks.com slash film threat, it's uh, a deal for filmmakers. It also helps support film threat by supporting our sponsor. And I especially want to thank author Christopher Vogler, uh, your book, The Writer's Journey, in its 25th anniversary edition. It's uh, just coming out. Um, it, it, it's amazing. Like I say, it's, it's in the top three, if not the top screenwriting book of all time, of all time. Um, so, so you, it's a must read, uh, Christopher, thanks for being with us on the film threat podcast. Uh, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Sorry about the interruption, but, uh, I enjoyed it and uh, glad to do it anytime. Well, I appreciate it. You know, we've had like, we've had cats on the, on the sort of make surprise appearances, dogs. We've had sort of crazy things happen. This is the first time we, we lost the subject, but it <laughs> happened. This is, you know what that is? That's that unexpected thing. You could Maybe. not have written this you That's you right. you know it's part of your journey in being on this show but um thank you so much i'm glad i i'm glad i found my way back again yeah